This video is sponsored by NordVPN. Get a free month with any purchase of a two-year plan and a surprise gift when you use the code SPITFLYER. Find out more in the description below. G'day ladies and gents, and welcome back to War Thunder. A lot of you have over the years requested that I go through some matches that I've played and break it down, talk about it, analyze it, and see exactly how I go through my thought processes when in, for example, a dogfight. Now, I have got myself a sort of ARB tutorial on the way. Uh, I've been working on the script for a while. I'm not quite happy with it. I've been revising it. But I will get you something a little bit more formal as such on the way. But having a look at actual dogfights and breaking them down is going to be a good start for this sort of series, if you will. And for this, we're going to be starting with the MiG-21 BIS. The MiG-21 BIS is probably the plane that I'm most comfortable in, uh, aside from the F4E at least at uh, high tier jets, and the MiG-21 BIS has that for a reason. It's a very, very capable jet, it has plenty of avionics, it has plenty of good missiles, and it has plenty of performance, which is very much up my alley. Personally, I am more of a sort of calculated aggression type of guy, where I would really love getting into dogfights, but I also love being able to accelerate and go fast, and the MiG-21 BIS fits the bill perfectly. The MiG-21 BIS also comes with six missiles, those have been customizable between four uh, R60s and two R3Rs, six R60s, six of basically whatever you want. Combinations of four and six are your, your go-tos. But honestly, I would go with four R60s, two R3Rs. They are going to be your sort of uh, wonder combo. But notice here that I'm not really climbing, and that's because the MiG-21 BIS doesn't really fit, fare too well at high altitude because of the AIM-7s. And, like, the performance is great at high altitude, it climbs really well, but I don't really want to use the climb rate because my weaponry isn't going to carry me that far, and as soon as I get hit with an RWR ping, I'm going to just go straight down to the deck where the F4 Phantom's radar is not going to work as well, and the AIM-7s are not going to hurt me. So, what I'm going to do here is I'm going up a little bit, looking for a target that's really not paying attention. If I can come from sort of below, I can come from the side and sort of, even if I do a little bit of climbing, a little bit of burst climbing, I can still get a couple of easy kills on phantoms that decide to go in and rush. And now I'm getting my RWR pings, what I need to do is basically try and find a way to avoid these missiles. You can see that it is a bit of a hassle and this F4E has decided to blow a lot of speed and altitude and my friendlies are basically there to clean it up for me. I've spotted something else on the radar, and there is also an F4C heading straight towards me from the right hand side. What I'm going to do, in order to not get run down by him, he's already a lot faster than me. Uh, I've realized he's going head on, so I'm not even going to take the head on. I'm going to go straight out, which reduces his ability to shoot on me. And whilst I go in for the reversal, a friendly comes in with his missile and absolutely obliterates the Phantom. If I had had another shot or had another pass at this guy, he would have been dead just the same. So, now's here where it gets interesting. I'm at low altitude and a little bit of low speed, so what I have to do is I have to pick up speed. I am not going to be taking any dogfights. You see, you do have the ability to pick and choose what dogfights you're in, but once you get yourself into too many, there is really no escape. And by too many, I mean too many opponents. This is going to be apparent in a few minutes, but have a look at this situation here. We're getting into a, an area where there are just so many opponents. I'm going to pause it here, and you're going to have a look at my tactics table. I've had this for a very long time. I paid some uh, artists more specifically, specifically, FFG and Reams who run Fifth Floor. These guys are really good. If you guys want any graphics, mer merch, anything like that, hit them up. They are fantastic. But uh, tactics table it is. I hope you guys enjoy. And we're going to sort of start to break it down now. Five enemies have just appeared basically out of nowhere. Five is a lot. It's a th over a third of the enemy team is in one spot. Four of those are in the same squadron. There's a high chance that these guys might all be on comms. So what are you going to do? If they're coordinated, they're going to absolutely make mincemeat of you. Well, you need to pick the weakest one. And you can't just quickly look up their stat cards and find out who's the worst, because if you try and focus them, then the other three will go on your ass like there is no tomorrow. What you need to do is you need to pick one that may not be paying the most attention. You need to pick one that maybe is at the back. And of course, if you're coming from low altitude, you come from below, burst up, 
then that's when you're going to get your best kills. You're going to get kills on people that don't even know that you're spotted. You can see that all of these guys are heading in the same direction, and chances are that they've got a lock on the enemy who's out there in the distance, which is, you know, they're friendly. Uh, and I know this because one of the F4EJs is firing a missile, and I would highly, highly bet that he's not launching an AIM-9J at the sun, but in fact he is launching an AIM-7 at an enemy that is on radar. So if these guys are to be feared, which they are, that's third of the enemy team, then you've got to pick one, and you pick the one that's the slowest, you pick the one that is at the back, and you pick the one that is at the altitude closest to you. So if you're coming from below, pick the one at the lowest altitude. If you're coming from above, pick the one at the highest altitude. That way you don't appear in front of someone's guns or someone's missile site or someone's radar. That way you can remain as stealthy as you can. And whilst the R60s don't have a great spool up time, you can still be on the front foot here. And the Phantoms are really bad when they're on the back foot. Have you ever tried to defensive line a Phantom? Have you ever tried to run in a Phantom? That's right. You can't really do that. Not for a long, long period of time. Because you just you just can't. The Phantoms really require being on the front foot. And while you can do sort of miracles with your R60s, you have to make sure that you are the aggressor in the case. And that you're not the one that is sort of on the back foot. Because being on the back foot in a MiG sucks as much as being on the back foot as it is in a Phantom. So, what I'm going to do here is engage this Mirage with the first R60, quickly prep a second R60, no I'm not going to do it, I'm looking for another target and there I go prepping the second one. I've decided to go for this Phantom here in the distance and, just, and then change the last second to the other Phantom. Striking the second critical hit, I'm going to go for this Phantom here because he's presenting the uh, largest sort of flank around and then now I have to dip below because this Mirage is now following me. The missile goes nowhere, so it's not for me, and I just continue straight. At this point here, I am not going to be risking a dogfight. You can't lower your speed if you're not in a 1v1. And here's the reason why the first, uh, first Aim9J comes out, and an F4C is coming out behind me. I'm going to pop a couple of flares, keep my speed, keep my afterburner, but fly in front of the flares, so that I basically show the flares to the Aim9J, by changing my course of pattern. Now I'm going to just book it, keep my speed, and maybe try and single out, string out another fighter to reduce the 1v1 capacity. The F4C decides he wants to rip his wings, which is a fantastic move for me, although I would have loved to have a really nice gun kill there, or another missile kill. So, now that the other opponents have uh, all been dealt with, I'm going to go back and deal with that F4E. The Mirage finally crashes, and this leaves the F4E basically as one of, if not the last targets here on the map. I'm going to prep an R3R, send the R3R on its way, and it's going to connect because the R3Rs are very, very nice and sneaky. The next one we're going to go for a quick head on. Listen to that gun just absolutely belting. Now, the GSH-23-2 does not have a very good uh, like rate of fire. It has a good rate of fire, but, but that's really about it. So I'm going to try and put that to use, I miss, but now that the F4E has gone up to altitude, this is my chance to use that R3R. He's going to come down on me, so I'm going to prep again for another shot, but I think I'm going to miss this one here. And now it's just another dogfight. The F4E is going to lose this, and I'm going to win this at some point. It doesn't matter, he can keep running, but I'm always going to be able to sort of keep up now at this point. He's just absolutely screwed himself over, and it's almost game over. I just need to get the shots on target. There we go. He's going to go down now. And uh, that basically highlights the efficacy of the uh, the MiG-21. If you're going to be finding a, a group of enemies, make sure you prioritize your targets. And if you are getting into a multiple engagement situation, don't drop too much speed. Because at that point, if you kill someone, someone else is just going to come in and sweep you. It doesn't really make a difference. Um, speaking of R3Rs being handy, if an enemy is slow like this, this... There's no, no dodging. They're great. They're great weapons, by the way. You should definitely keep some more handy. The MiG-21 BIS, pretty good. But we can't have MiG-21 BIS without F4 Phantom. The F4 Phantom, I would consider to be the analogue of the MiG-21 BIS in War Thunder, at least. The MiG-21 
is really good for those aggressive plays. But the Phantom, the Phantom shines in an advantage. I would very much compare it to Yak-3 versus P-51D. The P-51D is your hardcore boom and zoomer, and the Yak-3 just pulls the energy and acceleration out of nowhere. And that's mainly because they just chuck a big engine on a light airframe. Now, the thing that the P-47 doesn't have is excellent avionics and excellent missiles. The AIM-7s and the AIM-9Js are going to be your best friends here. Now, in this particular map here, we don't have a great uh, sort of expanse. We only have a small map, and this is going to limit our use of the AIM-7s. This means that we ideally should be climbing a little bit more aggressively, but in this case, I decide not to, and it still works out. I'll show you exactly what happens. So, Phantom, you've got to be climbing. That's the main thing with the Phantom. I don't climb in the MiG-21 because of the Phantom. AIM-7s have a 12 kilometer range and you should be basically using them at their 10 or 12 kilometers. Uh, in this case here I've spotted two targets here which are within 5 and it turns out it's a MiG-19 and a MiG-19. Uh, I'm going to basically leave them alone, they're too close, I'm not even going to go head on. I'm going to avoid this particular MiG-19 just quickly, going into a, a pitch up and just going to continue forward. Both of the MiG-19s are smart and continue to do the same because staying fast in jets is ideal. I see the MiG-21 and I think the rest of the enemies are going to come from this way but it turns out he's just sort of rushing in and this is where I make my definitive strike. I prep an AIM-7E, send it on its way and it begins tracking. You have to do this at altitude by the way. The AIM-7s don't really work on the deck and this is where the AIM-7 comes in handy. There we go, single kill on a MiG-19S might not seem like a lot, but it's really the start of something that could be really, really good. For those of you that know my F4 Phantom gameplay, and I have heaps of it on the channel, especially with the AIM-7s, you'll know that I love to do this. I will say though, 4km is a little bit ambitious for the AIM-7E. Have a look at how much it, ground it has to make up. So don't go doing stuff that is too ambitious with the AIM-7s. Go for head-ons and tail-ons only, or side-ons at the very most. Definitely nothing under 5 kilometers, and like I'm going to do here, I'm going to waste another AIM-7. Not ideal, but at the same time, it does make this MiG-19 dodge and puts him in a very vulnerable position for me to get a good gun kill. So, you can use your AIM-7s as distractionary weapons, but I would personally prefer to use them as killing machines. This is a good secondary benefit, and it just, it just happened to come out that way. The F4 here, or the F104, is going to be flying towards me, and this leaves me with an interesting situation. Have a look at the two groups of the opponents that are right here. Uh, you have the Wuna, uh MiG-19s that are sitting there off to the side. You have the F-104, and then you have this little cluster here of enemies. These guys are going to be the sort of the the real threat. Although at first, I think it's going to be the MiG-19 because I, he's at the higher altitude. And like I said, you always go for the one that is closest to you. So if you're on, on the top altitudes, you're going to filter down. If you're on the bottom altitudes, you're going to filter up. Unfortunately, this AIM-7 doesn't track, and then I noticed that a lot of the uh, MiG-19 has, the MiG-19 has a lot of friends, and I'm going to be able to go down to altitude, or to low altitude, to deal with these MiG-21s and uh, CL-13, and I think there's an F-104, no, there's three MiG-21s and a CL-13. Now, the Harrier there, and the there's another guy there, they're the only really ones left. Uh, and it's a little bit rough if you're a G91, an F100, and a Harrier against three MiG-21s and a CL-13. So I'm going to prep an AIM-9J, set it on the MiG-21 because he's the slowest target, and then I'm going to go for the CL-13 because he's the closest. And the next target I'm going to pick is the MiG-21. All of these guys are very focused on the Harrier, and I'm going to try and get myself a gun kill. Look how slow the MiG-21 MF here is. I'm going to go for the gun kill with the, uh, with the good old Vulcan, and the Vulcan is more than good enough to deal with things like the MiG-21, even at kilometer and a half ranges, provided that you're not traveling really, really fast. MiG-19 decides to come head on, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pitch up, and pitching up because he's not directly committing to me. If he was going to directly commit to me, then I would have just kept going straight. But I can see here that the MiG-19 is sitting in a straight line, not going to be a threat to me, and running out of the range of the AIM-9Js. Go for a quick head on with the F-104G, and I can see now that the MiG-19 is turning back towards me. Send him an AIM-9J, but it's not going to hit. And the F-104G is now my new target. Why? Because the MiG-19 is traveling across, and the F-104G was traveling away. 
and losing distance. Now he's decided to cut in front of me, and so he's gone the other way. I'm going to stick with him, and the other guy can stick with the MiG-19. So the F-104G here is basically fucked. There is nothing you can do, provided that I get this one aim 9 on. And it looks like I've managed to get a good lock. Beautiful shit here, and oh my god. Mwah. Molto bene. That's the kind of stuff that you can achieve when you play your cards right. You pick the right engagements, you pick the right enemies, and you filter from top to bottom. Using those aim 7s are your bread and butter. They're the ones that are going to be your winners. But what if you don't have aim 7s? In fact, what if you don't even have RWR, flares? What if you're not even supersonic? <laughs> This is the javelin, and the javelin here, we're going we're gonna to have a look at uh, sort of how to disengage. Disengaging is going to be the sort of little, little theme of this one. So, not only that, your positioning is incredibly important. On this map, you've got a little bit more room to play with, and it's a little bit wider. So, what I'm going to do is climb a little bit more, be a bit more steady, and notice that every plane is just a little bit different. This plane requires a lot of heavy climbing, and things like the MiG-21 BIS, you can sort of just go in. Now, in this case, I've decided to sort of stick onto my team's side and try and keep with my team a little bit because otherwise it's going to be a really, really hard time. Notice how there are a couple of attackers that have gone in and they've sort of made or turned the enemy team into lawnmowers all of a sudden. That's a really good thing, even though the IL-28 SH perished to a G91 R4. The G91 R4 is going to pay for it with his life later on because he doesn't have the altitude that he needs for a future combat. So thinking ahead is really important in RRB and going for a target that's uh, very low priority like an IL-28, especially when you have air-to-air -air missiles, is quite frankly quite stupid. If you're going to lemming train after a single bomber and then die to a fighter later on and complain about it, then I'm sorry, you don't know what you're doing. And in this case, a lot of people who lemming train after bombers tend to be inexperienced, which exactly makes my point. Not sure what he's doing. Anyway, in this case here, I have slightly misjudged the situation. The MiG-15 and two G91s are present here. The G91 pre-series here, which doesn't have any missiles, is going to basically give me his belly, which makes it a very, very easy kill. And now I'm going to quickly turn behind to have a look at my situation once I've leveled out. And you can see, holy moly, there is an absolute metric fuck ton of enemies behind me. There's just too much there, so I'm going to just keep going. There's no harm in extending. Obviously, don't extend for like a copious amount of time. If you are in a plane that can dogfight, then dogfight is what you should be doing. Because you can overshoot your enemy. And once you do that, you can basically get yourself a nice easy reversal. Now, in this case, I've basically managed to get all the opponents off my tail. And I've now got a little bit more speed and altitude to play with. That's one of the reasons why climbing is extremely important in War Thunder. And setting up your attack early on might seem a little bit boring, but it really does set you up for success later on, and that's the important take-home message that I'm going to give you today. If you forget all about this video, the one thing that you should remember is that climbing and setting yourself up in, in engagements is extremely important. Positioning of your aircraft means all of the difference. It allows you to wear down numbers, because at the end of the day, Air RV is a numbers game, and you should always remember that, always keep that in mind. So, now we have a chance to assess the battlefield. We have a quick look at the scoreboard here, and the enemy is starting to fall apart. But at the same time, they can quite easily bring that back. That's uh, one plane loss, and now two. There's not a whole lot that they can really do. So, let's have a look. We're going to have a uh, MiG-15 ahead of us, uh, another MiG-15 ahead of us heading down, and basically everyone else at sea level, which is going to be pretty easy. And this is exactly what happens when you don't climb, and it makes true for props, it makes true for jets, uh, and that's exactly what's going to be happening here. Two kilometers in, and mm, the missile hits at a nice 5 or 1.5 kilometers. Beautiful, beautiful missile there. It is a 13G missile, but 13Gs is only 3 over 10, which is what the Aim 9 pulls. So it's really not that amazing. However, against slow G91s, it is absolutely beautiful. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing, except here I'm not going to be firing my AIM-9 or my my oversized AIM-9 uh, because it's, he's going to turn and I'm going to go for guns, I don't get the guns, but that's unfortunate, it doesn't matter. I have air brake for too long here and I've killed way too much energy and that's one thing that you have to remember in jets, air brakes are not exactly your friends. I have heard that 
air breaker or pilots in real life didn't really use the air brakes that much except for landing uh, and I can exactly see why especially in War Thunder where your speed is vitally important. Air brakes can be used in combat of course but you have to make sure that you have a, either a friendly around or you're in a one versus one because otherwise that second enemy is just going to come and clean you up and there's nothing that you can do because you don't have the speed to avoid a missile. So. Speaking of missile, the MiG-15 has just decided to turn in front of a missile, which is very, very bad for his health indeed. And this allows me to uh, wrap things up with the Javelin. So, we're going to have a look at one more situation here, and this is the F-100. The F-100 here is accompanied by a uh, little green name tag above me, and that is Copsy. You can see Copsy is a streamer who uh, is insanely good at the game. Uh, he's been a buddy of mine for a few years now, and he's basically been in the game since its inception, and he's basically played every major War Thunder tournament that there is until like a few years ago, maybe a year ago. He was in the first Thunder League, which was War Thunder's attempt at a sort of an esports league. Uh, it's now sort of superseded by the TSS, but that's beside the point. Here, I'm playing with a friend who is really good. That's all I'm going to be saying. You should check his link out in the description below as well as, of course, uh, our video sponsor, which I'll get to a little bit later. So, the uh, F-100A here, this is the Chinese F-100A, and I'm going to be rushing in, which is normally a big no-no for the F-100, but here I am with a friend, and we're fairly coordinated. We're not on comms, but we are sort of fairly in tune with how we play our planes, and I am basically here to support Copsy. Copsy's streaming, I'm not, and here we go. I'm here, basically here to try and uh, limit the amount of primates that um, come towards Copsy's beautiful shiny plane. So what I'm going to do here is I found an AV-8. Uh, I think I'm going to pretty much knock him off as an easy kill, but it looks like he's paying a little bit of attention. And what I'm going to do here is launch an AIM-9. It's a little bit too ambitious, but I'm not going to launch a second one. He's going to start turning, he's going to start dogfighting, uh, and whilst the AV-8A is very, very bulky, I just decided to leave him. There are plenty of enemies around. I thought that guy was going to be able to take him out, but it's okay. There is a, a, a just score of other planes going for him. It's not even worth doing it. Have a look at the absolute monkey fest that that has turned into. So, you know what? I thought, I thought screw it. I'm not even going to bother. I'm not going to waste my resources. I'm going to go and basically take them somewhere else where it can actually help cops here. And so, our next target here is an F4C who's flying in a straight line, which is uh, very, very big brain. And so he goes head on with the MiG-19S, the MiG-19S and F-4C don't trade anything, and the F-4C now dies to an AIM-9B because he's realised only now that I'm basically on his 6. So once that's done, we're two missiles down, a little bit of ammo down, and one kill in. I'm going to go and help out my team again. I can see a bunch of enemies starting to come around. There's an F-3H. I'm thinking, oh boy, uh, that guy above me is not a good sign, even though I'm faster than him. I don't want to have something with AIM-9s above me when there are so many enemies around me. And so this F-3H here is going to be the next unlucky victim who's pulled it in front of me. So one of the take home messages again, watch for the guys around you. You never know what is going to be there. And in this case, the F-3H was the victim of his own, uh, I guess, blindness. Speaking of blindness, I see a Lightning F-6 and another Lightning. So I'm going to end up in a 2v2 dogfight with them. Now, in a dogfight, the lightning is not ideal. It loses a lot of energy, and something like the MiG-19 is going to be easily able to keep up with it. I think this lightning realizes, and he's just gotten really slow. I don't know why he's so slow, so I'm going to launch a missile towards him, and I managed to get a kill. Staying quick is the easiest way in the lightning to not get killed. Burning your energy in a turn fight like this is the surefire way to get killed in a lightning so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pitch myself up and I'm going to roll over. I'm going to roll over and then immediately cut straight back into him. But unfortunately for me, the MiG-19S manages to finish him off with a very decisive burst. Well, I'm going to roll over once again to deal with this hunter. And the hunter here is, uh, again, distracted. The key is here to not put yourself in a situation where you're going to be fighting more than two enemies. Always have a buddy with you. And honestly, that is your most secure advice from any sort of dogfighting or any sort of maneuvering if you just limit your engagements to 1v1s or 2v1s then you're honestly going to be fine you are going to win a lot of your dogfights because war thunder is essentially at the end of the day a numbers game 
and as you can see here, we've managed to whittle down the numbers to the point where the enemy is just not really functioning. A7D here is completely distracted and he's launching a missile. That missile is probably going to hit, but with a little bit of spray, I can bring the uh, poor MiG-19S a little bit of justice. And with half a wing, you're really not going to be doing anything in the A7D. Good luck landing, good luck even getting back to base, and the A7D will shortly bail out. But not before I have to deal with this Hunter. Again, I'm putting the nose down to keep a little bit of speed, and then I'm going to go vertical to throw the Hunter's aim right off and force him to turn. Because if he's got someone behind him, he can't just go vertical because that makes him slower and that makes him an easier target. The Hunter here comes down and up again, who's now going to go for either Copsy or going to go for the uh, MiG-19. But I managed to miss most of my shots, and now notice that I have 8 shots left. I have uh, not a lot of opportunity here to uh, get myself an easy kill. And it looks like I'm going to get myself a beautiful little kill here. Hmm, molto bene there. Again, once again, it's just a matter of discipline. Not going for too many engagements, not going for too many enemies. This way you can get very, very serious experiences. You can get some very, very solid War Thunder gaming in, honestly. It is just really, really solid. And just by playing smart, you can train yourself to be a better pilot by limiting your engagements, by using the best of your plane, and sort of by trying not to take on any irresponsible engagements. They're the real keys to actually being a good dogfighter. I understand that this might not be as super in-depth as you might want, but uh, hopefully this sort of does enough to give you a little bit of a gauge of what you want to do in a case of ARB like this. I will have more thorough tutorials, but for those of you that wanted to actually see me break down some gameplay and sort of go through my thought processes, then I really hope you enjoyed this video. I'd really like you to, um, you know, feed the algorithm for me. Give me a like, give me a comment, say hi, maybe I'll respond if there are enough comments. But uh, I would also like to have a little bit of a word from our good old sponsor. Alright, so b before I roll the proper ad, I... I'm just literally editing this. I got a call from my sister's mother-in-law and she said that she thought she downloaded a virus off a link that was unsecured. Now, I was thinking, what if all the boomers had VPNs? You know, all these oldies, you know, clicking on links and destroying computers and having someone come out. It's pretty expensive uh, and it's a massive hassle. So, Sometimes, you know, you'll get called over and, and they'll go, oh, yep, yep, you got a virus. To prevent all of that, just, just get a VPN. They need that added layer of protection more than anyone else. Hashtag VPN for boomers. Get your grandma one, get your parents one. They're probably bricked a laptop like um, my parents have. It's incredible. It's genuinely incredible. It works on basically every fucking device that you can think of, except like a smart TV. And honestly... It's a good deal, two years, one extra month free, and an extra little gift. Honestly, I'd, I'd go for it. Save yourself the, the, the sleepless nights, please. Alright, roll on with the proper ad. Picture this, you're up late one night, looking at videos of side skirts. Very lewd side skirts. And you're looking for a link. You're looking for the right one. And there you go. You see it. It's right there. So what are you going to do, obviously? Can you click on it? Is it safe? Well, with NordVPN, you don't even have to worry about it. With NordVPN, you get an extra layer of protection from data thieves. Especially useful if you use public Wi-Fi, and even more useful if you like watching videos of side skirts and spitfires on unsecured websites. Naughty, naughty boys. Access to region lock content such as the BBC or American Netflix so you can see side skirts from all around the world and in the best quality. The, ab the ability to browse the internet in China so you can see Chinese side skirts. Uh, anonymity when browsing so your nosy ISP or government can't spy on you while watching videos of side skirts. NordVPN's 5,500 plus servers, 24 7 support, and lack of data logging makes it an excellent choice for your internet security privacy, and access to a free and open internet. Honestly, I don't even think Gaijin offers 24-7 support, and the fact that they do that means that they actually give a shit. So, I think that that's a good idea. 
Right now, it's NordVPN's birthday, so if you purchase a two-year subscription, Nord's offering a free month, plus some extra gift just for the viewers of the channel. Go to nordvpn.com slash spitflyer. That is nordvpn.com slash spitflyer, and use the code on the screen to claim those extra spicy goodies to support the channel. Those of you that know me well enough, I won't take a sponsor from someone I wouldn't honestly recommend, and NordVPN basically fits the bill for that perfectly. Thank you to NordVPN for making this possible. With that concluded, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching, take care, and I'll catch you next time.